Hello. It's nice, nice to see you here. Um, it's just a good day to be indoors. And so we're happy that you chose to be indoors with us. This is pretty good outside. My name is Katie McKee. I'm the director of the Center for Study of Southern Culture. We want, as always, to thank the people who make this happen. Rebecca Cleary, who's our communication specialist here at the center, and make sure that you knew to come today. It works because here you are. We thank Afton Thomas, who is the associate director for programs here at the Center for Study of Southern Culture, and who organizes the South Talk lecture series that you are attending. And we thank Jean Talbot, who is memorializing today's talk with the camera right here, right here, Sharon, on camera, right here. What you came for today is to hear from Dr. Darren Grimm, who's an associate professor of history and Southern studies at the University of Mississippi and our longtime colleague now here at the Center for Study of Southern Culture. He's really familiar with this room where we are because he's taught lots of classes right here, a regular in the Southern Studies 1.0 classroom. Uh, 101 and all the numbers that come after that and we'll be in the fall teaching of course Southern Studies 118 which will take us its focus country music. He's also our long-suffering undergraduate advisor for the Southern <laughs> Studies major, a position from which he is retiring as quickly as he can, as he tells me, after many years of service. He's the author of The Blessings of Business, How Corporations Shaped Conservative Christianity and what we're going to hear from today is a selection from his next book, which is Hard Times USA, The Great Depression and the New Deal in American Memory. Please join me in welcoming Jen. Thank you all so much for uh, being here today. Uh, again, thank you, Katie, for that wonderful introduction. Thank you, Afton, for, for everything. Thank you, Neem, for, for uh, making my uh, presentation um, last now for posterity, I suppose. Um, airing for nine seasons from 1972 to 1981, the Waltons became a staple of CBS's primetime offerings and winner of five Emmy Awards. The show was a work of televised memory of the Great Depression and New Deal and World War II, set in Western Virginia in the fictional Appalachian town of Walton's Mountain. The Waltons, of course, fit into a broader era of Southern fixations in American popular culture and political life during the 1970s, from deliverance to Dallas and roots to rebel flags. Historians have largely interpreted such cultural fixations as first ventures in reframing the region and nation's cultural and political identity after decades of fights over race and civil rights. Or they've presented such Souths of the mind as imaginative escapes from the decade's socioeconomic and political turmoil, or ways to debate the South, with the South as a symbolic point or counterpoint to national matters of concern. Similarly, historians of the 1970s have largely cast the Waltons as a rural manifestation of the working class, a romantic and nostalgic foil to goofier or grittier offerings, ranging from All in the Family to Sanford and Son to Taxi Driver and Norma Ray. By contrast, I see the Waltons as not a new cultural venture, but as one of the latter acts in a long national drama of remembering, forgetting, and politicizing the Great Depression and New Deal via memory. Scholarship on the Great Depression is largely focused on its most trying years, roughly from 1929 to 1945, but my next book shifts the historical narrative and analysis after 1945, exploring how post-World War II Americans remembered and used the Great Depression via popular culture and in their political activism for and against the New Deal state. More broadly, this book pushes American memory studies beyond its fixations on moments and eras of national formation, civil and foreign wars, and social movements for fuller citizenship. In doing so, I hope to interrogate how conflicts over the public interpretation of past forms of capitalism, of capitalistic collapse, of systemic deprivation, and public trauma, as well as state intervention, shaped conservatism, liberalism, and other forms of cultural politics and polity. Through my book and briefly through my time today, I want to suggest a different way of thinking about the legacy of the New Deal as well. The New Deal was not just a set of policies or point of political identification and debate. The New Deal was a complex and conflicted process of cultural construction and reconstruction that occurred via memorial debates at multiple sites, however incompletely or unevenly, however powerfully or pervasively. 
The South writ large and writ small via the South of the Waltons was one such site. The Waltons was the brainchild of Earl Hamner, Jr. He was born in 1923 and he grew up in Schuyler, Virginia, about 25 miles southeast of Charlottesville. Now I can provide more information about Hamner's upbringing and writing before the writing career before the Waltons during the Q&A if you like, but for our purposes today, I think it's important to note two things about him. One, he fit into this long-standing trend of privileging the South in Great Depression memory. And secondly, his experiences in the 1930s and 1940s certainly shaped almost all of his novels and subsequently laid the groundwork for the Waltons. Now to that first point, the South was replete with historic sites and experiences that served as a storehouse for Great Depression remembrance. Warm Springs, Georgia, where FDR passed away in 1945, had for a quarter century been a memorial site of high renown and routine pilgrimage, a veritable shrine to FDR and the New Deal itself. Across the Southern Rim, folk imagery and recordings of depression-laden farmers, prisoners, and migrants collected by everyone from Woody Guthrie to government agents to folklorists and the Lomaxes inspired folk preservationists and revivalists and political actors well into the 1950s and 1960s and beyond. Landscapes of labor conflict and racial terrorism from the Piedmont of the 1934 General Textile Mill strike to lynching and mob violence sites all across the region underwent rounds of intentional forgetting and patchwork, often internalized memorialization. Dozens of public works projects from the TVA's dams and reservoirs to rural electrification, even kudzu, held a certain powerful or controversial place in Southern memory, not to mention memorial devotion to the South's, a Depression era South's literary icons or some of its racial symbology first put into, public, into the public sphere in the latter days of the Great Depression. Most sites, however, worked less as forms of public recognition of popular unrest or state action and more as atomized forms of folksy remembrance about personal forms of adaptation or deprivation. This is certainly the stories that I heard growing up from my grandparents who made their way through the Great Depression, canning fruits, mending patches, stretching dollars, paying rents, trying to make ends meet. Stories told and told, albeit through individualized means. As a southern site of memory some 40 years after the Depression's hardest days, the Waltons family suggested connection, not distance, between the depressionary generation of the 1930s and a recessionary one in the 1970s. According to Earl Hamner himself, the keys to navigating hard times in the 1970s could actually be found in the 1930s. That is, individualism, self-help, but also honest dealings and meaningful work, tempered by local and family bonds and connection. On its face, it seems like a strikingly conservative message, an invitation to find resilience and inspiration for wistfully upholding or actively reviving a lost status quo. Or, as Hamner put it, in 1974, quote, we are in agony as a people. We desperately want to believe that our heritage is a, is a proud one and that we can survive this present disillusionment and doubt. We have discarded the old values and have found nothing to take their place. We are alone, we are afraid, and we need security, end quote. Into this void stepped the Waltons family's conventions. Quote, that is why I believe the Waltons have struck such a deep response in the viewing public. They are sick of vulgarity and violence of suggestive dialogue, so-called sensational subject matter, shallow plots, one-dimensional characters, and the pap and pulp they are offered." End quote. For Hamner, the Depression offered Americans, quote, some anchor to keep the audience afloat through this present turmoil. I believe we are not only bringing our audience entertainment, Hamner surmised, but some hope that if we once endured a depression, then it is possible we might endure it and survive this present test of the fabric of this justly proud country. The show certainly hit primetime TV in the midst of an undoubtedly more conservative political moment and difficult economic time, the worst since the Great Depression. Indeed, the Waltons premiered on September 14th, 1972, right as the intensity of, of Richard Nixon's campaign for re-election revved up. 
And numerous commentators observed, like CBS's more urban working class show, All in the Family, that the shows seemed to speak to and for a nation reeling from social discord, political division, a losing foreign war, economic uncertainty, and then certainly in its later seasons, oil shocks, as well as this dramatic, scandalous fall of a president through a Watergate affair. Indeed, into the late 1970s and early 1980s, the shakiness of the American economy demonstrated here kept depression and the threat of a depression on many Americans' minds. As literary scholars Stephen Bree observed 35 years later, by 1972, quote, the spirit of communality, a communality generated during the early years of the peace and love 60s had largely evaporated, especially after the, great, after the Vietnam War, the assassinations of JFK, Martin Luther King Jr., and Bobby Kennedy destroyed what he termed nascent optimism. And in its place is what he called collective pessimism haunting the American viewing public, whether of Archie Bunker's generation or his daughter Gloria's. Through the Waltons, at least, once per week, however, viewers seemed like they could fall back into a, quote, comfortable, soft focus, homey world, promoting a positive perspective on life, underpinned by moral certain certitude and primacy of family values, end quote. Each episode's famous sign-off equated family ritual with family unity, with the latter according, a specific according to a specific place, namely the quaint southern Appalachia imagined as thriving despite of and because of the hard times of the Great Depression. Right, now, get some sleep. Good night, everybody. Good night, Mama. Good night, Ben. Good night, everyone. Good night, Mama. Good night, Daddy. Good night, children. Good night, Daddy. Good night, Elizabeth. Good night, John Boy. Good night, Jim Bob. Good night, Jim Bob. Good night, Jim Bob. What's going on? I was asleep. What's everybody doing? Good night, Good night Jim Bob. <laughs> <laughs> Password lurk looking, even conservative escapism, however, does not explain the Walton's appeal or remembrance narratives in full. At least not over the series' full run through the Great Depression and World War II, with season one approximating 1933 and season nine roughly approximating 1945. Indeed, change and adaptability also defined the South of the Waltons. In this way, actually, art imitated life, at least in the television industry of Nixonland. As numerous historians of broadcast television have noted, a, quote, rural purge struck the range of popular shows by 1972, from the Beverly Hillbillies to the Andy Griffith Show to Petticoat Junction. Favoring a younger demographic and an increasingly suburban viewer base, Cowboys, hillbillies, and other rustic others hit the cutting room floor, resulting in a re-urbanization of American television akin to a de-southernization of sorts. Or, as Patrick Buttram, who played Mr. Buttram in Green Acres, put it later, quote, CBS canceled everything with a tree in it, including Lassie. The Walton's equation of South with Rural thus stood as an outlier in the midst of network programming shifts, and some viewers and critics saw it as a token concession to an older audience raised on a ruralized version of Southern media motifs. Other structural arrangements in nighttime programming also seemed to hem in the Waltons from the start, even setting it up to fail. NBC already had a hit on its hands with the Flip Wilson show, airing at 8, 8 p.m. Eastern time on Thursdays and featuring one of the first variety shows with an African-American ringleader. ABC's popular Mod Squad, featuring certain black power of stylings also seemed well positioned to box the Waltons out. Working out of what Hamner called a, quote, suicidal time slot, the Waltons had to await audience support, even as CBS put a committed marketing campaign behind it, with all the not so veiled and familial appeals of, in an era of silent majority politics. Its audience, somewhat to the surprise of CBS executives and Hamner, showed up in mass. By the end of the first season in 1972, the Waltons led the cross-network competitors in Nielsen ratings. By the end of the second season in March 1974, it held the top spot in overall rankings for nighttime network programming. The show's exact audience, at least as determined by CBS executives and viewership data, did not necessarily correlate with easy characterization. To be sure, some fans of the Waltons had lived through the Great Depression, and the show fit the demographic of white, middling to working class wor viewers who might seek out such stylized rural worlds. That was increasingly only there here in the Waltons and on, of course, 
hee-haw, another southern means rural holdout in the 1970s. It certainly offered a formulaic approach to storytelling akin to its contemporaries and predecessors. This was signaled by, of course, the show's opening theme and its rollout of setting and character. Presented over the course of this scene is a landscape defined by Appalachian people. John Boy, really Hamner's on stand-in, looking wistfully out of an upper store window as a precocious writer. Mother as a tender of home, home and children. Father as resourceful provider and backcountry every dad. Grandparents as cheerful and wizened elders, all topped with the arrival, of course, of the family's first, ro first radio and a family portrait. The Walton's first episode made a passing reference to John Boy remembering, quote, when I was growing up during the Depression. And other earlier episodes established the main characters and setting as in the hardest days of hard times. The show initially only differed in a few minor details from the source material, namely Hamner's novels and personal remembrances. More family members appeared on screen than in Hamner's novels, totaling six brothers and sisters and a dog, with parents and grandparents living at home, a true extended family that suggested the experience of doubling up and room mating among American families in the 1930s. As in the Hamner's childhood home, FDR's portrait hung above the fireplace, but the show's aesthetic suggested a world actually living in the aftermath of the post-war era instead of in its prelude. Indeed, one feasible reason for the Walton's appeal was its aesthetic throwback not to the 1930s, but actually to the 1950s. Indeed, Walton fam the Walton family home itself seemed out of place and time, better suited for an age of suburban po prosperity and not in my backyard politics, however rustic than an age of systemic penury and state intervention. The Walton's farmhouse suggested as much. To be sure, Hamner's home in Schuler, which he lived in from 1929 to 1940, had similar characteristics to the home presented in Walton's Mountain. According to a government report, both were, quote, a two-story, three-bay frame dwelling located along a common access road. Just like Hamner's childhood home, the Walton home had an expansive front, front porch draped in vines and fronted by flower beds. Still, it differed from the show's set in several important and telling ways. Hamner's home was not a rural, independent homestead as in the Waltons, but, quote, one of several surviving company houses associated with the local soapstone industry that operated in Shuley in the early 1900s. Unlike the Hamners, the Waltons had a crabgrass uh, patch lawn, a patchy crabgrass lawn, and a seesaw. And inside, Hamner's television family enjoyed all the trappings of mass consumerism in a modern American atomized space. Their set piece home was well stocked, decorated, separate rooms for dining, cooking, and sleeping. The entire Walton clan might live under one roof, of course, but the abode suggested a mid-century upper middle class home at the end of a suburban cul-de-sac, if in need of an exterior paint job and interior, interior decor update. Electric lights, appliances, and radio made the, came to make the Walton uh, house and memory more modern than most Southern Appalachian homes in history. Indeed, other than the ubiquitous presence of straw hats, overalls, homemade dresses, and period automobiles and trinkets, the Waltons could have been the cleavers. White Southern survivors, turned into suburban strivers. The world of the Waltons signified a suburbanization of depression memory in other ways. The Walton family lived and worked in a self-contained world, geographically and culturally as far from a city as possible. Walton's Mountain stood at the polar opposite of urban cityscapes of racial, social, and political culture turmoil and striving, at least as imagined and experienced from the perch of a suburban housing development or subdivision. Contemporary movies processed urbanity through numerous mean streets or French connections and their imp impresarios and knockoffs. Television featured crop and crime, cop and crime shows, city hall political dramas, and cosmopolitan after supper, supper offerings, from All in the Family to Maud, Sanford and Son, and later, of course, the Jeffersons. The Waltons presented rurality, or rural life, albeit by shoehorning it the 1930s into a post-depression sprawl suburbanity or suburban life, even exurban life. Now, of course, rurality 
rural life and suburbia had a long history and actual and imagined overlap. But, the Waltons, but in the Waltons, the parochialism of the former served as a synonym for the racial and social insularity of the latter, with outsiders presented as the only challenge to familial stability and personal sublimity. As Robert Ziegler looked back on the Waltons in 1981, just as the season entered, series entered its final season, every threat to social order, good manners, and filial love that bound Walton to Walton came from, quote, foreigners, drifters, fugitives, orphans, and others just passing through. External disruptions, not internal conflict, born of hard times and systemic deprivation, defined the Walton's depression. Executives intended that arrangement, and Hamner and his writing staff complied over the course of the series. As they wrote to Hamner early on, quote, the network, or the network wanted to show to thread the needle between, quote, exe ex executive sentimentality and believable human warmth. Easy stereotypes, whether hillbilly rubes or debased proletarians or any other motif that suggested the rural shows of the previous decade or the old leftism of Woody Guthrie and, say, Erskine Caldwell, had to be avoided. Quote, that the Waltons are poor should be obvious. Hamner wrote in production notes that there should be no hint of squalor or debased living conditions usually associated with poverty. Severe deprivation happened elsewhere, out of sight and mind, just like perhaps in an idealized suburban enclave. For such reasons, the New Deal and the Waltons thus occupied an elited presence. With no struggling poor depicted, the, wel the, the welfare, public works, provisional state had an interesting role to play as a character in the show. Most often, it simply existed as a kind of background prop. To be sure, the Depression often received direct mention in John Boy's opening dialogues. And poor folks were there, albeit from often outside of the Walton's immediate sphere. At least during the first six seasons when the time line of the sh before the timeline of the show moved beyond Pearl Harbor. But only in a few episodes did the New Deal come to the forefront or serve as a sort of character or at least stage setter. And one such season is this one here, The Boy from the CCC. Aired on November 2nd, 1972, just five days before Americans would go to the polls and reelect Richard Nixon to the presidency. He used one of the most famous alphabet agencies of the New Deal as a setup for this episode's story. It was a, CCC was a federal agency, uh, infrastructure project, a jobs program, known, of course, as the, as the Civilian Conservation Corps. It worked from 1933 to 1942, inveighing young, unmarried men to work in a variety of public relief and public works projects, especially in environmental improvement and conservation. In the remembered world of the Waltons, the CCC camp nearby to Walton's Mountain, however, put out a poor ambassador for the program, but a good archetype of the show's approach towards the New Deal and how political concerns of the 1970s flavored its remembrance of the New Deal and its liberalism in the 1930s. The boy from the CCC is Gino. He's a runaway of questionable whiteness from a nondescript North, presented later as an Italian-American from New York City. He had a tough upbringing on the main streets of Hell's Kitchen, with his family regularly forced to play, pay protection, as he put it, quote, to hoods. Enlisting in the CCC due to unemployment, but finding it, quote, too much like the army, Gino left the camp because some guy took my money and they tried to pin it on me. Took some money and they tried to pin it on me. The Walton family furnished Gino with generosity, food, lodging, and encouragement. But sadly, Gino stays a dodgy, rude, and uncommitted individual, eventually stealing the family's savings and, and nearly earning arrest by a local sheriff. But then a conversion moment. What happens. do you care? You know, I really don't get this family. All of this worry over, over some poor little crummy animal. And, and you and your father and everybody trying to turn me into some kind of an angel. That's not so. I just hate to see you have to throw your life away. What do you care? I mean, why should my life matter one way or another to a, to a bunch of dirt poor hicks? Look, Gino, we may be a bunch of dirt poor hicks, but we got something a lot of other people miss. My mother and father happen to really love each other, and they happen to love their children. I've done an awful lot of thinking about what makes this family work, and I think it's because there's love enough to go around and some to spare. 
think when my daddy looks at you, he sees me if I'd been born in Hell's Kitchen. I guess maybe we just care about life, whether it's a wounded raccoon or a runaway boy. Afterwards, Gino softens, offers consolation to John Boy's younger sister. She mourns a dead raccoon and opens up about his own father's death and then recommits to the CCC after the family covers for his theft with the local sheriff. The episode ends with a reflection on the New Deal itself, noting that the CCC left behind a national park, likely Shenandoah National Park, built from 1933 to 1941, and visited in autumn by people, according to John Boy, quote, driving for hundreds of miles to refresh their souls and their spirit with beauty. It's interesting here, however, as to who's refreshing Gino's soul, who's filling his spirit with beauty. It's not necessarily the New Deal's provision of work, it's of course the Walton family. Familial love, family support, provided a kind of rural redemption. That's what provided the critical step for sending Gino in a different direction. The moral to this story of this episode is repeated over and over during the Walton's uh, first season and subsequent ones, and it's a mixed one about the place of the state. On the one hand, the New Deal state meant well. It produced a savior figure in FDR, so enshrined elsewhere, and certainly in Warm Springs, Georgia. It offered a much needed safety net when capitalism faltered or failed. It provided infrastructural improvements to Walton's Virginia. For the most part, however, the New Deal remained a back background motif, most often mentioned in passing and used as a narrative comparison to the values embodied by the Walton family. For instance, Works Progress Administration, or WPA signs and improvements, only appear briefly in one episode. In another episode, a fifth season episode, the NRA, that's the National Recovery Administration, has signage that fronts the Godsey's family store, much as they did in countless stores around the country in the 1930s. In the foreground, however, is always the Walton family and the show's supporting cast. Altogether, they exuded a 1970s relocation of 1950s style suburban values and politics, interestingly enough, to the very landscape, not just, to, not just New Deal projects, but to great society projects. Lyndon B. Johnson's famed, inherit, as he saw it, inherited extension of the welfare state through the war on poverty. In doing so, the Waltons taught audiences subtle lessons about the limits of New Deal style liberalism while conveying newer ethics regarding the personal responsibility to affect change. If the 1950s, 60s, and early 70s served as a source material for the conservative side of the Waltons' 1930s, then so too did the post-war era's culture and politics. As historians like Jim Collin have, exp have explored, a small litany of other episodes focused on themes raised by other more innovative or controversial shows of the 1970s and clearly illustrated the impact of the post-World War II era's wide-ranging social and sexual revolutions, especially regarding race and gender. Alcoholism, prescription drug use, teen pregnancy, sexual assault, all receive attention as main plots or subplots in, in specific episodes. Arson, committed by a local school, committed against a local school for teaching evolution, earns more opprobrium from, than support from the Walton Mountain, Walton's mountain community. That the arsonist had also been an abusive father and husband places him as contrary to the familial ideals of loving masculinity so common throughout the series in characters like uh, John Walton and Grandpa Walton. Remember Grandpa Walton, we'll come back to him in a few minutes. Regarding the color line in Walton's Mountain, the Walton family hardly stood for a racial status quo. In fact, the Waltons unabashedly used the, the racial politics of the civil rights era to retell stories of hard times for racial minorities, especially in this setting of the Jim Crow Depression era South. More pointedly, black and indigenous characters worked as the main vehicles for exploring or centering race in the Waltons' Appalachia. The first black character to appear in the world of the Waltons came in the fourth, fourth episode of the first season. Hawthorne Dooley, a preacher from a local black church, signaled the racial separation in the religious culture of Walton's Mountain, but his joining the Walton family on a turkey hunt suggested a measure of token integration and selective inclusion. And of course, was it a far cry from certain recreational cultures in the rural South at the time? Later in an early second season episode titled The Roots, a migrant black family appeared, consisting of Verdi Grant, a widow of, with five children, and her husband, Harley, future husband, Harley, and their son, Jody. 
They decide to lay down roots in Walton's mountain, convinced by the generosity and unqualified um, hospitality of the Walton family. <clears throat> One of the more notable and poignant examples regarding race and the Great Depression in memory in the Waltons, John Boy's narration during this episode certainly speaks to using remembrance as a way of reframing racial tension as well as action. This is how he considered the Great Depression, and certainly how he considered the Great Depression by its, its end, and by the end point of the Waltons' own series uh, run. Here the, the Waltons' uh, racial ethic seems to ring clear. White folks properly oriented around good manners and intentions, suffused with grit, forged by the hard times of depression and war, they themselves could routinely prove sufficient to solve the racial problems of the 1930s. A regulatory state, especially on matters of, say, racial justice or interracial relations, simply did not appear as a formative or active agent for change in the world of the Waltons. That's certainly there. But another forthright racial role for the New Deal and, its, and the New Deal state in memory appeared in the outrage, a, a two-part ninth season episode in which FDR's last day centered the drama. Harley Foster now helped, helping out at the, at the Walton, with the, helping out the Waltons at the, their local sawmill, has a run-in with several unabashed racists, including a cafe cook who refuses to serve him coffee, and a racist cop, ironically, overseeing German POWs on break from a local labor camp. Accused of being a fugitive on the run for murder, he claims he only committed in self-defense against a rich man trying to cheat him out of an auto repair bill. Foster becomes a foil for society's assumed black criminality and a framework for the family's conversation about racism witnessed in other arenas of life, all, however, outside of Walton's Mountain. After failing to both hide Foster from the law and find an easy means to his exoneration, John Walton takes inspiration from the picture of Roosevelt hanging on the wall of his house. He leaves for Georgia, specifically Warm Springs, Georgia, to gain a pardon for Foster. Given the latter, given Foster's service in World War I in the Navy and the President's role at the time as the Secretary of the Navy. In one of the show's most fantastical interpretations of the New Deal, Walton's, uh, John Walton secures a presidential pardon for Foster from the President just hours before he dies aligning in memory both the New Deal and Roosevelt administration with racial justice. With Foster freed, the rest of the community, including Foster's wife, Verdi, learns of FDR's death, one at a time. Verdi comments on how FDR had helped black folks out, as well as comments that he is a man worthy of their veneration. It all finally centers on John Walton himself bidding the dead president goodbye, famously stating, Goodbye, Mr. President. Never seen a boy so down in the dumps with school let out. There's not much to be happy about. That's true, Josh. But your dad wouldn't want you to mope around all day. And neither would the president. Was he a great man, Mama? Yes, he was, Josh. He was a very great man. He cared about everyone, rich or poor. Even about us? Yes, Josh. Even about us. that President Roosevelt did was sign Holly's pardon. Oh, I still don't believe it. Oh, I do. You're here, Holly. You're really here. The train bearing the body of Franklin Delano Roosevelt moves slowly from Warm Springs, Georgia, toward the nation's capital. Wherever it went, the people who loved him gathered to mark its passing remembering the man who led the nation out of its most crippling depression and toward victory in its greatest war, planting seeds of brotherhood along the way. When it 
passed through Charlottesville, my family was there to pay their last respects. That this aired on November 27, 1980, just two weeks after conservative Republican Ronald Reagan's election to the White House, also held a certain poignancy, even if more coincidental than intentional given that the show was already in the can months prior. But given that the show's adaptations to long-standing demands of racial minorities and women for more representation in simple respects, so episodic treatments showed the Waltons as a version of the 1930s more open and tolerant than the actual 1930s. It also presented a new, the New Deal's racial limits in an accurate light, and thus offered a subtle criticism of it from the perspective of over three decades of activist protest to reform or reject post-war liberalism's racial power base. Saying goodnight to FDR and his New Deal meant a memorial departure from the foundations of the Democratic Party and its frameworks, both in terms of its provisional, active welfare state and in terms of its racial limits. Outside of cultural on-screen culture politics, the Waltons, however, also fit snugly into the 1970s, particularly through its niche consumerism. Selling consumer goods along various racial, ethnic, economic, religious, and political lines, corporations broadened the consumer's republic of the post-war era through identity-specific modes of buying and selling. The Waltons, as a popular television show, offered its own contributions to this brand of niche consumerism, fitting into a motif of depression-inspired remembrance consumption popular off and on since the 1950s. Similar to FDR memorialists buying and trading in Rooseveltia, it's a real category of memorabilia about FDR. Various forms of New Deal tourism, folklorists repackaging everything from Woody Guthrie's catalog to the Lomax's field recordings into a form of kind of depression chic for middle class consumers. The Waltons joined in selling lunch boxes, toys, dress up dolls, comic books, and games. Remnants of the Great Depression as retail. Actors on set even got into the game, albeit by trying to recreate different linkages between 1930s memory and 1970s consumerism. Will Gear, who played Grandpa Walton from 1971 until his death in 1978, used his renewed acting career to both restore his reputation in the court of American public opinion and highlight his long-standing creative relationship to one of the most memorialized, remembered, and resold figures of the Depression years, Woody Guthrie. Bisexual, and communist leaning, Will Gear had refused to answer questions during a HUAC hearing in 1947. Blacklisted by the major studios in the Red Scare of the early atomic age, he turned to stage acting in a long time friendship with Guthrie, for whom he recorded tribute albums and held benefit concerts for the sake of an ailing former bard of the Dust Bowl, all while pushing back on what he saw as the misappropriation of Guthrie's leftist ballad, This Land is Your Land, into a post-war paean of, of American exceptionalism and patriotism. Hired by Hamner simply because he physically fit what Hamner imagined as the role of grandpa, and possibly because Hamner decided to look past Gear's political history and sexuality, he found a new platform to, to put out another folk record for Folk Ways Records. It was a tribute al album to his now dead friend titled Woody's Story. Now to wrap up today, I want to briefly note the afterlife of the Waltons after it goes off the year. And wrap up thinking about what does this all mean regarding the remembrance of the Great Depression and New Deal. Now there was a series of post-series follow-up specials. Um, they all were set in 1947. They were interestingly devoid of uh, the re readjustment recession that was there in 1947 and Harry Truman's first term. But 
they basically set up, uh, you know, tried to try to set up a an afterlife for for the Waltons that additional specials followed up on in the 1990s, in 1993, 95, 97. By that time, however, the Waltons had transitioned off of broadcast television and become a centerpiece show on cable television, specifically on the family channel run by Pat Robertson's Christian Coalition. Shortly after gaining the syndication rights from CBS in 1991, Robertson's vision of family values vis-a-vis -vis the Waltons became primetime politics and late-night joke fodder. In a January speech in 1992 before the National Religious Broadcasters, a conservative evangelical media lobbyist group, Republican candidate George H.W. Bush linked the Waltons to his conservative Christian base. Well, let me tell you something. We are going to keep on trying to strengthen the American family to make American families a lot more like the Waltons and a lot less like the Simpsons. Here's the Simpsons and the writer's response. This was in the off season. They were showing a rerun of this, this particular show, but they worked up a quick response week of to Bush's uh, slamming of the Simpsons. We are going to keep on trying to strengthen the American family to make American families a lot more like the Waltons and a lot less like the Simpsons. Huh? Hey, we're just like the Waltons. We're praying for an end to the Depression, too. The joke spun Bush is trying to sidestep responsibility for Reaganomics, the recession of 1991 and 1992, with a red herring of anti-family television programming. It also reminded viewers of an uncomfortable fact. The Waltons remained family, remain, maintained familial ties in an era of economic strain, much like the Simpsons did. Observers rightly reminded Bush that the Waltons were hardly the nuclear family that values voters routinely imagined as their ideal at least once one looked past surface appearances. The Bush campaign, however, continued to use the line and the image of the Waltons as a conservative familial ideal throughout his 1992 re-election campaign, including a welcoming rally at the, at the Republican National Convention in Houston. In the same year as its bit role in presidential politics, the Waltons also garnered a certain physical fixity on the memorial landscape of the South, this time in the place of its, ver of its birth. Schuler's Virginia, Schuler, Virginia, Hamner's hometown, never recovered from the Great Depression, slowly leaking population from a height of 7,000 residents in 1930 to a fraction of that by the time its most famous family finally said goodnight for the last time. By the turn of the 20th century, only about 500 residents remained. In short, it became another victim of broad post-war restructurings in demography, economy, infrastructure, and culture, as did the surrounding area of the actual Walton's Mountain. In response, as in countless faltering communities around a small town, rural, or off the interstate south, a nation heritage or historic district tourism sought to stop the bleeding. And in 1992, with seed money provided by a $30,000 grant from the state of Virginia and a generous anonymous donation, possibly from Hamner himself, the Walton's Mountain Museum opened in Schuler. The meta-ness of this site was hard to miss. This was a museum doubling as a memory scape of the South's depression fomented in fiction and popularized via television. It was a relatively successful business venture, but more recently, it has fallen on hard times. Today, the museum is listed as, quote, temporarily closed. It'd be enticing to consider the Walton's Museum or the Walton's television show as exceptional regarding the historiographical or historical implications of its memorial past, but it is not. Sites of memory left behind by the Great Depression and capitalism's collapse remain everywhere in the United States and elsewhere, as do hundreds of physical reminders of the New Deal's import and legacy, active or inactive memorials and cultural landmarks of what historians have called the, quote, hidden welfare state, albeit here on the physical landscape, only hidden in plain sight. That said, hard times hit the people that Hamner memorialized in particular ways during and after the 1930s, and so did the economic restructurings large and small a slow rolling collapse that drained Schuler, for instance, of people, capital, and jobs, making it a real life depression land, even as the town's fantastical depression captured the attention of millions in TV land. When not apparent and systemic and thus undeniable, hard times hit in a subtle manner, often atomized to the individual level or instead of memorialized or narrated in public as a matter of politics. 
the recession that the elder, that the elder Bush's administration faltered on, the Great Recession that the junior Bush's administration struggled to address, and the economic crisis caused by the COVID-19 pandemic, and the loss of life with millions dead, suggest these costs and these public remembrances. Those certainly that the Waltons once spoke about, however problematically or incompletely. If memory is less about the past and more about the present, then the South's Great Depression, as per the Walton, shows the context, selectivity, and universality of such stories of hard times, as well as the creative and editorial decision-making that can even turn capitalism's past failures into the potential for present-day profit. It also shows which narratives punch through and which do not, in which context. And finally, the Waltons show how remembrance and forgetting that capitalism enables the, and the Waltons show how the remembrance and forgetting that capitalism enables or leads can become like a chorus of familiar good nights, ritualized to the point that they resound less like history and more like memory, less like fact and more like fiction. Thank you.